Hello, welcome to this edition of Momentum. I'm your host, Robert Green. We're fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Carrie Babsky-Reeves. Dr. Reeves is the Associate Dean for the Bagley College and also Department Head and Endowed Chair for the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department. Dr. Reeves, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. So, so industrial engineering is a, an interesting topic. Can you tell us a little bit what, what is an industrial engineering or what would an industrial and systems engineer do in, in the world? Sure. So industrial engineering look, takes complex systems and looks at the integration of the person, the materials, the information, the equipment, etc with the ultimate goal of improving efficiency, eliminating waste. We're really process engineers, so the way we look at all of these systems is, is there a better way to do this process? Um, so, you know, we may take a product, a good, or a service, and we will improve the design of it, make it more usable, figure out how to actually make it, and then how to distribute it to the people that need to use it. Okay. so. I think your, your specialty within the, the field of industrial engineering is ergonomics and human factors. Can you tell us a little bit about, about those subspecialties? So human factors and ergonomics basically is looking at what a human can and can't do and then designing tasks around those abilities. So what are we able to do physically? What are we able to do cognitively? And then making sure that we're not asking too much or not enough of the individual because both of those results in uh, reduced performance overall. Now, how I became interested in it, uh, my mother is a beautician and I can remember her starting to talk about feeling numbness and tingling in her hand, which is actually some symptoms for a workplace disorder called carpal tunnel syndrome. So my, my interest spurned for my mama becoming injured during um, her job and then wanting to understand what was causing that. So actually my very first study was to quantify risk factors for beauticians in the development of workplace injuries. That's interesting. I doubt many people would connect those two <laughs> professions together. That's but, true. Yeah. So other than um, those two subspecialties, what are some others within industrial engineering that students could pursue? Yeah, sure, so our department really has five areas. Human factors and ergonomics is one of those. Um, the second would be engineering management. So that's looking at how to manage complex engineering problems or engineering firms. Uh, we also do supply chain, logistics, and operations research. So that's looking at how goods or services are distributed. So you have to look at how materials come in, and that material may be information as well, so keep that in mind. And then how to get that good or service uh, delivered. We also do manufacturing, of course. So how do you manufacture equipment or, or products? Um, what are some new and innovative manufacturing technologies like additive manufacturing or Industry 4.0? And then, like a number of fields, data analytics has become very huge in engineering. Some of that's related to the manufacturing aspects, but we're using data analytics in terms of um, cancer image uh, analysis to, de to detect cancer earlier uh, and more accurately. So you can use it in just about anywhere. Um, we're also using it in the field of what we call athlete engineering, which okay. is part of human factors and ergonomics. So that would be wearable sensors on sport athletes, soldiers, or even industrial workers to measure their performance. So it sounds like there's almost no limit to what you can do with, with that degree. I think that's one of the benefits of an industrial and systems engineering degree is that there's not an industrial sector that you won't find an IE in. And what's somewhat unique about the IE degree, uh, as opposed to the other engineering degrees, is that we, ha we by our ABET accreditation, have to develop you also on the business side. So we're training you in terms of business acumen so that you can speak not only to the engineering side, but you can also speak to the CEOs and CFOs. So that makes us ideally suited to become managers. Okay, That's very interesting. Um, you actually have two jobs on campus, um, and I think most people would consider either one uh, very demanding, but you know, you're not only an endowed chair and head of a of an engineering department, but you're also an associate dean. Mm -hmm. uh, and everywhere we go around campus, they talk about what a good job you do in, yeah. in both. So what's your secret to being able to, to do the work of two people? Sure. Well, it's nice to hear people think I'm doing a good job because I don't necessarily always think that. Um, 
it is hard to manage both of those jobs. They, they, they are full-time jobs. And truthfully, I don't think I could do it if my department wasn't the size it was. So it is a smaller department. Um, having said that, we're one of the most active departments on campus. Um, so that makes it a challenge as well. I think what has allowed me to be successful is not necessarily myself in particular. I have a really strong group of people on both sides of the house. So the people that I work with, like you and, and Daphne Knox, Dean Newell, Tamara Swan, and other people that I, I'm not going to be able to mention in the dean's office, um, my undergraduate coordinators, my ABEC coordinator, uh, my graduate coordinator, my staff, um, you know, I'm able to rely on the quality team that I have around me. Um, I give them direction, I give them expectations for what I'm expecting in terms of how they support what it is that I'm having to do in both of those roles, but my leadership style is to allow them to figure out how to use their unique capabilities in the best possible way to do those jobs. Without those individuals, there's no way I could do this job, the, either one of these jobs, um, and certainly not together. So behind every successful person, there's a hardworking, successful team. The, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, one of the issues we, we face and are always working on in the College of Engineering, and, and it's not just our college, it's a, an issue in the entire engineering profession, mm -hmm. uh, is a lack of diversity, particularly with women and minorities. Um, so as a woman who is not only in the profession, but has achieved very high level of success in the profession, um, what was it that was attracted you to the profession and made you successful? And what can we do to get more people like you in, uh, to be engineering? You know, I think all of us have experienced some sort of bias. Um, even you would have experienced something. I think what's really important is when I was growing up, there were really three things that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a basketball coach, I wanted to be a teacher, and I wanted to be a brain surgeon, none of which I ultimately became, to do, came, became except for a teacher. Um, so I knew what it was that, or the types of problems that I wanted to solve, I guess is a good way to put it. I didn't even know about engineering until I got a letter in high school from college asking me to consider engineering. Um, and then when I started looking at the engineering disciplines, industrial engineering was the only one that really mentioned the human, you know, now we have biomedical engineering. But I think that's what's important is that the students are females or other under represented minorities really need to think about the problems that they want to solve and then think about what disciplines will allow them to approach those. So ultimately, remember brain surgeon, I became a human factors and ergonomics specialist. Yeah. So I was able to feed that anatomy and physiology desire that I had um, in, in terms of that profession and then you know became a professor. So that fed my teaching desire. Um, so I don't know that that's a magic pill, but that's what I encourage people to do. Think about the problems and then what disciplines allow you yeah. to do that. Well, that. That's interesting. What advice would you have for maybe K through 12 teacher or even parents of, of daughters or, or uh, other underrepresented minorities? What could they do to encourage and if not encourage, at least keep them from discouraging um, those people from pursuing uh, an engineering? So a lot of people, when they find out that I'm in engineering, go, wow, you must be really smart. And I go, well, yeah, in some ways, but I'm also really stupid in other ways, ways that you probably or might be really smart in. Um, for example, my, my writing ability and my ability to spell is really, really terrible. Give me a math problem, I can solve it all day. So I really think it's just about pulling out what those students are good at and encouraging them to continue to grow in that strength. And hopefully some of those strengths are in that math and science field that will lead them then into engineering and other STEM disciplines. Okay. What advice do you have for men who are in the engineering profession? What, what can we do to make it more inviting and receptive to, to females? You know, I've been really lucky. Um, I've had several men in my career that have been really supportive of what it is that I'm doing. In fact, two of my best mentors are actually men and they're not females in the area. Um, I, would, I would just say that men need to just consider why they think the way they think, why they have the preconceived notions about females in the field that they do. Because once you're aware of how you think and feel about a specific group, you can work to kind of address those. I have my own that I have to work on every day. So it's, for me, it's all about becoming aware of why I'm thinking that way so that I can develop strategies 
to, for me to deal with those notions. Okay. So putting on your associate dean hat, one of the areas you deal with a lot is research, and we certainly have a lot of research in the college. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the research that's going on here in the Bagley College and the impact it's having on the state? Yeah. I could probably spend all day talking about the research in the College of Engineering, so if I forget something or some area, I hope the college will, will be graceful with me. Um, you know, the university has four research thrusts right now, which are uh, bringing autonomy to the mainstream, securing our future, addressing disparity, uh, and leading the 21st uh, century economy. And engineering is across all of those. So for example, we're the lead institution for the FAA in terms of bringing autonomous air vehicles into the um, airspace with manned vehicles. So that's looking at regulations, it's looking at sensors on these vehicles. Uh, in terms of securing our future, we're one of the three, uh, one of the few universities with all three NSA Center for Excellence designations. And a lot of that resides in our computer science department. So they're looking at operations research and education dealing with cybersecurity. So that can be antennas, that can be um, working within various networks, that can be looking at offense and defense in terms of cybersecurity. In terms of addressing disparity, looking at how we can improve transportation in rural areas so that individuals have access to health care or even other mediums for providing that health care to individuals. In terms of leading the 21st century economy, um, Mississippi State and the College of Engineering has always been strong in materials uh, and also in manufacturing. So a lot of the advanced manufacturing industry 4.0 research is going on out there. I've mentioned wearable sensors earlier. We do a lot in terms of robotics and a lot of different areas such as child therapy, um, search and rescue, um, and as well as you know on harvesters for um, harvesting food stuffs in agriculture. So, you know, again, I could go on and on in some of the research, but those are, those are some of the up and coming. There's certainly a lot going on. Uh, so we have about one minute left. So could, okay. could you real quickly sort of thought, so I think you're sort of like me. You came to college with absolutely no intention of going to graduate school, yet here we are both having gone. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for an undergraduate student to sort of keep their options open and prepare themselves for that possibility? So I have two pieces of, of, of advice. One, find your, your support group. I would have not made it through college without the group of students that we studied with because there were areas where I was stronger and areas where they were stronger and we helped each other through all of it. And the second is to persevere. You know, I had the semesters where I earned the not so good grades, grades less than C. Just don't give up because in the end, no one's gonna care about that one C, D or F. It's whether or not you made it through the degree program. I think that's very good advice. I wanna thank you for, for joining us today. Appreciate it having you here. I want to thank you all for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Momentum.